so uh, this afternoon, uh, Professor Takahiro Sagawa uh, will give his uh, first lecture on uh, thermodynamics of information. Okay, so please welcome. Thank you for your introduction. I'm Takahiro Sagawa from University of Tokyo. So actually, this is my first trip to abroad after COVID, so I'm a little bit nervous. Anyway, so yeah, I, I am a theoretical physicist working on statistical physics and quantum physics and a, and a little bit about biophysics. Today I will focus on some basic concepts, fundamental concepts of some dynamics of information. In particular, I will focus on classical aspects of some dynamics of information because it is related to biophysics and also perhaps some machine learning or something like that. So <laughs> historically, this is a very old topic. It, it dates back to the 19th century uh, proposed by Maxwell. So <laughs> Maxwell proposed a sort of experiment called Maxwell's demo. So this is a small figure here, but I'll explain about it later in detail. So how many students have heard about Maxwell's demo? Oh, maybe more than half. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I, I will explain it about in detail later. So also another modern aspect of Maxwell's demo, it's, uh, it, it is related to some interregion of thermodynamics and information theory. So recently, thermodynamics has attracted renewed attention in terms of so-called stochastic thermodynamics. I think Professor Lee uh, already talked about uh, modern thermodynamics until yesterday. Unfortunately, I missed it, but I, I, I hope you are already familiar with uh, that kind of formulation of stochastic thermodynamics. That is one uh, basic background of my talk about some dynamics of information. Another background is, of course, information theory. So how many students are already familiar with information theory, like channel information or mutual information or something like that? Oh, just a few, okay, <laughs> I see. So, okay, so I guess many of you are familiar with thermodynamics more than information theory. So I, I will talk about both of thermodynamics and information theory, and then I will combine these two concepts and how to understand the modern aspect of Maxwell's demo. So I will also talk about uh, some experimental realization of Maxwell's demo, and also a little bit about its application to biophysics, maybe tomorrow. Okay. So this is the plan of my four lectures. I will start with a very broad introduction to this topic, and then I will talk about an introduction to information theory. This includes channel information and mutual information, or something like that. And then I will talk about the second law of thermodynamics in the presence of Maxwell's demo. That is a kind of generalized second law of thermodynamics by incorporating information terms. Then I will talk about some experimental demonstrations of Maxwell's demons. And then maybe from tomorrow, I will go to more comprehensive theory of thermodynamics of information, including uh, measurement or information erasure or something like that. Uh, that is not restricted to the conventional Maxwell's demonstrations. And I will also talk about entropy production I think this was already introduced by Professor Lee. And uh, I will also talk about some autonomous Maxwell demons. So this is, this is related to biochemical signal transductions or some biophysical situations, because in our cells, um, there's no external agent that performs measurement on feed or feedback from the outside of our cell. Instead, inside the cell, there are some molecules that can be regarded as, regarded as a kind of Maxwell's demo. And I will talk about how we can theoretically understand that kind of autonomous Maxwell's demons. Okay, so and 
please interrupt me at any point if you have any questions. Okay, so then I will go to the broad introduction to this topic. Again, I think this was taught by Professor Lee yesterday. So um, modern background of um, thermodynamics of information is uh, stochastic thermodynamics. So this is related to various systems, including, for example, quantum systems and uh, bio biological molecular motors. So here is a typical ex real experiment about uh, thermodynamics of small systems. For example, we can imagine that there is a single RNA molecule. Then we can stretch it by using two coidal particles like this, and we can control them by using optical tweezers, for example. Then we can consider, consider that kind of experiment as a analogous to a classic experiment of uh, macroscopic thermodynamics. For example, in macroscopic thermodynamics, we can stretch a rubber, for example. Then we can measure the free energy change or entropy change uh, by, uh, by using some work experiments. In this case, uh, the rubber is corresponding to just a single molecule, that is a RNA molecule. And we can even measure the single molecular free energy uh, of this kind of uh, system by using this experimental setup. Um, an important point is that uh, there is a very big heat bus around the RNA, mo RNA molecule, so we can even consider a single molecular level thermodynamics. So then we can measure the work of free energy, and important point is that in such a small system, so nonlinear and non-equilibrium behaviors are typical. So it, it is easier uh, to reach nonlinear regions than the macroscopic systems. So this kind of microscopic thermodynamic systems are ideal platforms to understand the nonlinear and non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Okay, so then this is, uh, for example, this is a schematic of work distribution of this kind of RNA experiment. So in macroscopic systems, the work doesn't have any distribution, it's just a deterministic quantity. If you measure the work in the macroscopic world, you always get the same value because the thermal fluctuations are negligible. On the other hand, in this case, in the case of the microscopic systems, the work is a random variable. So we have some distribution, and uh, we have the average right here. And then we can confirm that uh, the work satisfies the second law of thermodynamics only at the average level. So the left-hand left side here is the ensemble average of the work, and the right-hand side is the free energy difference. So we can see that the average work is always greater than the free energy, free energy difference. This means that the perpetual motion of the second kind is impossible, even at the microscopic level. But on the other hand, <laughs> we can uh, see that, for example, in this region, so there is a small probability that the work uh, doesn't satisfy the second law of thermodynamics. This is because uh, work is a stochastic quantity at the macros microscopic level. So sometimes we get more work than the free energy difference. So this is a very rare event, and that vanishes in the macroscopic limit. So it is irrelevant in the mi macroscopic world. But in the microscopic scale, so we, can't we cannot ignore this uh, small probability that violates the second law of thermodynamics. So that is a very important idea to uh, consider the thermodynamics of small, small scale, and it's relevant to, it is relevant to the fluctuation theorem or the Jardin scale quality. That I think that was mentioned by Professor Lee yesterday. So, and also another 
perspective is that we can even actively utilize, actively use this rare event that violates the second law of thermodynamics. That is the main idea of Max's theorem. If you actively extract the work of this region, then you will get, or you will be able to accumulate the work from the system. But for that purpose, we need to some, uh, we need some feedback or measurement protocols. So that is the key idea to realize Maxwell's demo that I will uh, talk uh, in this lecture. Okay, so now from the modern point of view, the Maxwell's demo can be regarded as a kind of an agent that performs a measurement and feedback, and that addresses uh, the event that can violate the second law of thermodynamics. So, but that kind of active control is not free and it requires some cost, some additional cost. That is another aspect of Max's demo that I will talk uh, about it tomorrow. So, <laughs> based on that kind of considerations, uh, we can see some foundation of the second law of thermodynamics from the modern point of view. And uh, we can apply it to understand some designing principles of, for example, artificial nano machines or nano devices. And perhaps we can apply it to biological situations. Okay, so now I will go to the simplest model of Maxwell's demo. So actually, the Maxwell's original sort of experiment, sorry, sort of experiment like this, is a, a kind of, a, not so very quantitative, but it's a kind of qualitative a demonstration of the work extraction. So, but after that, in already 100 years ago, Sirad considered a very simple model of Maxwell's demo. So it was, it is very quantitative and based on this very simple model, we can understand the essence of the connection between some dynamics and the information. So I think if I have to choose some, just one slide uh, as a take home message for you, so then I would suggest that this slide engine is the most important idea. Okay, so, so this, this is just a single molecular heat engine and this green ball is just some molecule or atom or some single particle. That is inside a, inside a box like this. And the box is, in, uh, is attached to a heat bus at temperature T. So th this temperature is kept constant. So we always consider the same temperature T during this whole process. And in the initial state, uh, the particle is moving around here, and this, that is completely random, and the initial state is in summary equilibrium. Then uh, I will divide this box into two boxes, left and right. And at this stage, uh, the move of the particle is completely random, so we don't know in which box the particle is. So, okay, and then uh, the Maxwell's demo appears, and the demo performs a measurement about the position of the particle. For example, if the demo finds a particle in the left box, then, uh, okay, so uh, and after that measurement, the demo performs a feedback control. So if the, part, the demo finds a particle in the left box, then the demo does nothing. But if the demo finds the particle in the right side, then the demo moves this box uh, to the leftmost side very slowly. During this operation, uh, what the demo does is just look at the position of the particle and move the box depending on that outcome. So it is important that in the right case, we don't need any work to move the box in principle because uh, we can consider that the pressure is uh, balanced between the left wall and right wall, so it is possible to 
move the box without any work uh, from right to the leftmost side. So <laughs> then we can see what happens here. So in the initial state, uh, the particle is randomly distributed, left and right. So we have entropy of row two. But after the measurement and the feedback, the particle is always found in the left side. So here we don't have any entropy. So entropy is zero here. So that, that is the important operation of Max system. So without injecting any work, the entropy of the gas, single molecular gas, is reduced by log two. So this entropy reduction is, is the essence of Max system. For that purpose, we the demo <coughs> always needs uh, to measure the position, and without that, uh, it is uh, strictly impossible to reduce the entropy. That is the second law of thermodynamics. But anyway, in this case, the demo the demo gets one bit of information, and uh, the demo reduces uh, the entropy of the system by log two. And <coughs> okay, so and also. Here, one bit of information is described as log two of information. It's a natural logarithm. So this Ln means uh, log of nat natural logarithm in the following. So uh, in physics, it is nat more natural to choose uh, the natural logarithm than uh, the usual bit. Uh, so, so the dem gets log two of information here, and then. After that feedback protocol, uh, we can expand the box uh, from here to here, and the volume becomes twice. So <laughs> during this exp uh, expansion process, uh, we can extract KT log two of work from this uh, gas. So this can be calculated by using uh, the equation of motion, of, uh, equation of states of a single molecular gas. So maybe, let me write down something. Okay, so maybe, so this is, can you see this? Okay, so this is a, a state of, a, the equation of states for a single molecule. So, and then we can write down as, is given by this. So the work is now given by here V to V. And you easily get that uh, this integration is given by log two. So we can see that in the final exp expansion process, uh, we have KT log two of work from this system. So now we can see that the demo gets log two of information, and finally we get uh, KT log two of work from the final expansion process. So, so now the work is proportional to the information here, and the proportion proportional constant is given by the Boltzmann constant and the temperature. So this is uh, the most fundamental uh, aspect of the relationship between information and uh, thermodynamics. So th this is based on just a very, very simple sort of experiment, but we can generalize this kind of idea to general system, including very complex systems like molecular machines. So <laughs> we can see that the, uh, the thermodynamic work or the heat is not quantitatively related to the information content. In this case, that is uh, Shannon information or uh, the mutual information here. Again, the important point is that the Maxwell's demo can reduce the entropy by row two by using the measurement and the feedback. Here, feedback means that the move of the box depends on the measurement outcome. In the left case, the demon does nothing, but in the right case, the demon moves the box to the leftmost side. So, okay, so that, that is the, 
operation of Max says demo. And the decrease of the entropy means the increase of the free energy. And the free energy is the resource of the work. So we can finally extract the KT of work uh, from this cycle. So, okay, so this is the, this is a Schrader engine. And also, we can see that the initial and the final state of this cycle is the same. So, we can extract uh, the positive amount of work, this, from just a single heat bus. So, apparently, it seems that this is a kind of the part, perpetual motion of the second kind. But, as uh, I talk maybe tomorrow, so this is not a real perpetual motion of the second kind, of course. So, the second law is finally not violated. At, at this point, I would like to emphasize that uh, the information content here itself has some kind of entropy. So, the point, uh, so we, we have to add this information entropy to some dynamic entropy. And if you consider the entire entropy, including some dynamics and information, then the entropy increase always increases and the second row does not violate it. So, <laughs> but anyway, so, and the interesting point of this kind of slide engine is that uh, without performing <laughs> measurement and feedback, uh, we cannot reduce the entropy of the system. In other words, without injecting the work or the free energy directly to the system, uh, we cannot uh, increase the system's free energy. But in the presence of Maxwell's demo, we can perform the measurement and feedback, and uh, we can extract uh, the work from here without injecting uh, directly, uh, without inje injecting energy directly to the system. So, the, so in that sense, the novel point of thermodynamics of information compared to conventional thermodynamics is that we can increase the system's free energy even if there is no energy, no direct energy flow between the system and the Maxwell's demo. Here the Maxwell's demo is called controller or memory or anyway, so, so yeah. If these two objects are completely energetically separated, so we can control uh, the system's free energy. So that is a uh, new point of some dynamics of information. So also, there's a long history of uh, this topic. So first, Max has considered the sort of experiment, and then Sirard, and then many physicists uh, co uh, discussed the Max's demo, especially why Max's demo does not contradict the second law of some dynamics. But in the 20th century, so these arguments are based on a specific uh, sort of experiment like Slado engine, or also in the case of the Landau zero principle. So they consider a very special uh, but important setups. So in these decades, uh, there are some new insights on some dynamics of information based on modern theory of some dynamics. Uh, also, there are many experiments nowadays about the real uh, experimental realization of Maxwell's demo. So now we can say that this is Maxwell's demo is a very hot and active topic. And yeah, it's not just a historical thing, but it can be regarded as a modern physics topic and that have many potential applications ranging from quantum information theory to biophysics. So these are just two examples of uh, experimental demonstrations that I talk maybe in the next class. So anyway, so so there are many other experimental demonstrations. So now we can investigate 
the role of information in some dynamics in various experimental platforms, including quantum ones like ion traps or uh, superconducting qubits or something like that. Also, there are some potential applications to biophysical systems. So this is uh, my paper that is seven years old. So we, <laughs> yeah, we applied uh, theory of some dynamics of information to biochemical signal transduction. So in that case, we tried to quantitatively characterize the robustness of adaptation by this kind of cell, and that is an E. coli bacteria, um, against the external noise. So and we found that some information flow can characterize the bound of the capacity of this, ad ad this kind of adaptation. So I will talk about this if I have time tomorrow. Also. So this is just a, a brief introduction to how thermodynamics is a, can be applied to uh, biochemical uh, stuff. Okay, so at the end of this introduction, so <laughs> let me just advertise my book. <laughs> so yeah. I wrote this, I published this book this much, I think. So yeah, this is very mathematical paper including both classical and quantum uh, thermodynamics and some entropies. So <laughs> actually this is very mathematical style, like definition, definitions, and theorem proof. But if you are interested in that, so yeah, please look at, yeah, this, actually this can be viewed in archive freely, in free. Okay, so now, okay, now <laughs> I'll go to uh, brief introduction to information theory before I'm going to some dynamics of information. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, yeah. it is first time to see what the gelatin engine is. Me. So, sorry, could you say? Okay. It, it's the first time to see what the gelat engine is for me, so I have, I'm a bit confused. So could you show the slide? This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, I think you said that when the demon find particle at the right side, uh, demon can move the particle to the left side yeah. without any work. Yeah. How it is possible? Oh, yeah. So this, we can imagine that just move the box very slowly to the left side. Slowly? Yeah, yeah. So in some dynamics, so if, uh, we, if the process is extremely slow, that is called the quasi-static process, mm -hmm. we don't need any additional dissipation. So, so yeah. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. And also, so in that sense, this move of the box doesn't require any additional dissipation. Mm -hmm. And also the pressure is balanced between this left, or I mean the center wall and the right wall. Pressure? Uh, pressure is balanced. Pressure is the same, so I mean. I mean, so here we have the same pressure here and here. Uh -huh. That means that if we move this box very slowly to the left side here, in principle, we don't need the work because the, work, uh, the force we require here and we require here should be the same because the pressure is balanced. Uh -huh. So then we can move this entire box very slowly to the left side. And then if you do that, very slowly, then it doesn't require any additional dissipation. Okay, so yeah. to be worked as an engine, yeah. I, I think it should be returned to initial state. But if you move very slowly, it sounds like it requires like infinite time. So how, right. it, how right. it works? Yeah, so in, it, it is typical in some dynamics. For example, you, <laughs> if you operate kernel engine, that, that is our 
reversible and maximum power, uh, maximum efficiency heat engine. So that also requires infinite time. So it's kind of idealization. Right, exactly. So you always need uh, a very long operation time to get the maximum efficiency. Thank you. Yeah. Also, so also, I think a simpler way to understand this feedback process is feedback processes. Actually, we don't need this uh, this step in principle. I mean, so. Starting from this, <laughs> so this is a measurement, and then uh, another way to perform the feedback control is if the particle is found in the left side, then we attach the weight, weight something like this, weight here, and if the particle is uh, found here, then you attach the weight here. So then you can expand the box to the final stage. In this case, to this direction, and in this case, this direction. So if you do that, so you can skip this, uh, this process of, of uh, this process. So the reason why I inserted this feedback process is uh, just to visualize uh, that the uh, entropy is reduced during this process. So the, what's going on here is essentially the same, but we can skip this, and directly we can expand the box. If you find the particle in the left side, then you move the center, central wall to the right most side, and if the particle is in, found in the right side, then we move the wall to the left side. So th th that's a simpler way to performance of feedback output. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's, uh, this? The direction of the uh, hanging the mass looks uh, change. I mean, because uh, it, the, in the right, right side, expand to the left side, so yeah. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so you mean the weight should be attached like this? Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions? Uh, also, another interesting point is that this Slard uh, engine was uh, uh, the Slard considered this engine even before Sh Shannon uh, formulated the information theory. So at this time, in, in 1929, so nobody knows about information content uh, quantitatively. So but uh, Slard considered this kind of correspondence between log two and the work. And after that, uh, the Shannon found a way to uh, format information content. So <laughs> in that sense, uh, the link between thermodynamics and the information is, uh, fa was found even before the establishment of the information theory. Okay, so now I'm going to a uh, brief introduction of uh, information theory. So I, I suppose that most of you are not very familiar with uh, information theory, so I will start from a very beginning. Okay, so here's the channel, here's the channel. So he established information theory almost by himself alone, so now, if you look at some very 
short review or short textbook, then it's, I think it's almost the same as Shannon's original paper. In that sense, Shannon established uh, information theory in a very modern way uh, based on the, uh, in these two papers. So these are modern textbooks. So I think the most famous one is Carbon Thomas textbook. So this is, but this is a very heavy textbook, maybe 500 pages or something like that. So, and there's also a short introduction to classical information theory in this quantum information textbook. That, that part is very concise and I can, can recommend you, even if you are not interested, you are not interested in quantum situations. Okay, so, and Shannon introduced two types of information contents. So one is called the Shannon information or Shannon entropy, and the other is named mutual information. So both of, both of them are very important in some dynamics of information. So I uh, explain both of them from now. Okay, so now the first important concept is called the Shannon information. So for example, we consider, consider this kind of, for example, rotary. And if you pick up this orange ball, so you will, be, you will be surprised. But if you pick up this blue ball, I think you will not be surprised. So in that sense, um, a rare event has more information than an ordinary event. So that motivates, uh, that motivates us that uh, a smaller probability implies uh, larger information content. For example, in this case, uh, event K, like orange or blue, has some probability PK, and then we can define that the information associated with that uh, variable as log of uh, one over PK. So this satisfies the requirement that a smaller probability has larger information content. And the reason why we have logarithm here is that uh, we can naturally expect that uh, information is a kind of additive quantity. So if you have two independent uh, information sources, uh, then <laughs> you, will get, uh, that, uh, you will get some, uh, some information at the sum of this uh, individual information. On the other hand, the probability is uh, given by the multiplication of two independent uh, probabilities. So to convert that multi multiplication to the summation, we can just take the logarithm here. So th that is basic idea behind this definition. And <laughs> then we can take the average over all events like blue or red, and then we have the Shannon information of this form. I think this is a very f a famous expression uh, of the definition of information. So, <laughs> so we have PK here, and essentially this is minus log PK. So we have the minus P log P uh, expression of information content. So that is the definition of Shannon information. And the channel information satisfies these two basic inequalities. The channel information is always greater than, greater than zero, and that is not greater than log n. And n is the number of possible events. In this example, we have red and blue, so n is two. So the Shannon information takes the maximum value, that is log n, when uh, the, these events are completely randomly distributed. I mean, when the probability is given by one over n for every k. And it, it is natural because if the event is completely random, you can't see what will happen uh, beforehand. So your average information will be maximized in that case. On the other hand, 
uh, channel information becomes zero if the event is deterministic. Deterministic means that there is a single, just a single event that has probability one, and for all other events, the probability is given by zero. In that case, you will know what will happen beforehand. So the information is just zero. For example, you know the uh, anything, so yeah, any deterministic event, like tomorrow is Friday, so then actually tomorrow is Friday, so you will not be surprised. And mathematically, that, uh, in the case that P is zero, we have zero log zero, and that is eventually zero, so we have uh, the zero channel information here. The simplest example is this binary case. So we have two possible events, like zero and one, and the probability of zero is given by P. In this case, the channel information is given by this, and uh, takes the form like this. If P is given by one half, in that case, uh, the channel information takes the ma maximum value, that is log two. And on the other hand, if P is zero or one, then the channel information is given by just zero. Okay, so this is general mathematical properties. Also, you can prove that, uh, uh, prove this right inequality by using, for example, Lagrange multiplier method. Well, well, if you are familiar with the callback driver divergence, then you can more easily show this inequality, but I will skip that. Okay, so this is a very general definition of uh, Shannon information. That, that is also called Shannon entropy. Um, <laughs> and compared to thermodynamic entropy, uh, the information entropy can be defined for arbitrary probability distributions. So that means that uh, information entropy can be defined even for non-equilibrium situations. Only in the equilibrium case, so information entropy reduced to the ordinary thermodynamic entropy. So that is actually shown by hand. So <laughs> for example, if you have the canonical distribution like this, so this is, this X is a system, uh, some, you, you have some thermodynamic system, and E of X is the energy of that thermodynamic system. And this is a canonical distribution, and this is a partition function. And also you can define the equilibrium free energy and the average energy. And from the direct calculation, you can show that uh, the Shannon information is essentially, essentially given by the difference of the average energy and the equilibrium free energy. And this, mean, uh, this means that uh, in the equilibrium case, the Shannon information satisfies the standard thermodynamic formula like this. So in that sense, uh, thermodynamic entropy is equivalent to information entropy in the equilibrium limit. So maybe I can show this. So. So our probability distribution is given by this. Now we can calculate the channel information as So log of this is given by given by this.
and we can calculate like this. So, yeah, this is just, just log of p, and yeah, this can be converted like this, or sorry, maybe, oh yeah, this. And this is nothing but the, uh, this is given by e, and this is given by beta of f from the definition of equilibrium free energy. So we can get that the channel information is given by the difference of the average energy and the equilibrium free energy divided by the temperature. So, so we can easily show that in equilibrium case, the channel information and the thermodynamic entropy are equivalent. So in that sense, we don't need to distinguish information and entropy. So as a terminology, so we can say channel information or either uh, channel entropy. Okay, so this is channel information. Now, <coughs> I will go to the, the other information content that is called mutual information. Oh, so far, any questions? Okay, so let me go to uh, the other information content that is uh, mutual information. So we have the, okay, now we consider two systems. Uh, the system and the other is called memory. So we can imagine that the system is something like heat engine, and the memory is uh, a Maxwell's demo. So you can imagine that inside the brain of Maxwell's demo, there should be some memory, and the information is written in that memory. So in that sense, so this is uh, Maxwell's demo. So and the Maxwell's demo performs some measurement, uh, and the memory gets uh, the information about the system. So, and, uh, but in general, the measurement is not perfect, not necessarily perfect, and there is some noise or measurement, uh, measurement error or something like that. So, by reflecting that imperfection of the measurement, the effective information that the demon gets is less than uh, the channel information itself, but it is given by the mutual information. So the mutual information is the effective information content that is obtained from uh, some noisy measurement with some error. So this is a simple example of uh, noisy measurement. So this uh, left zero and one represent uh, the original <coughs> state of the system. And this zero and one, the right zero and one represents uh, the state of the memory. And we can suppose that there's some uh, epsilon, uh, that is the error rate. And even if the original state is zero, we have uh, outcome one with probability epsilon or vice versa. So this is a typical setup. So this is sometimes called a binary symmetric channel in the context of communication theory. So also, we can also, we can consider that this measurement process is a kind of communication from the system to the memory. So communication means that uh, the system's information is sent to the memory, and that is mathematically equivalent to the communication from S to M. So in the context of some real communication by, for example, by internet or something like that, so uh, there is some, uh, person called, for example, Alice, and here is some person called Bob, and Alice sent some, sent some information to Bob. And the effective information content that is sent from Alice to Bob is uh, quantified by the mutual information. So that is the original context of mutual information in information theory. So Shannon considered some communication processes, and he wanted to quantify uh, the information content from uh, that is sent to one person to another person. But in the physics context, we can use mutual information to quantify the effective information that is obtained by the measurement. 
Well, more formally, we can define several probability distributions. So uh, the, <laughs> this P of S is the original probability distribution of the system. And this P of M is the probability distribution of the memory. And this P of M and S is represents the conditional probability of the uh, of the memory. I mean, this means uh, the probability of M under the condition that the original state is given by S. So in this case, uh, the probability of P of M equals zero and sorry, M equals zero and S equals one is given by epsilon because uh, the probability that uh, the memory state is zero under the condition that the original state is one is given by epsilon. And also we can define the joint distribution of S and M that is given by the, just a multipli multiplication of the system's uh, probability and the uh, conditional probability. Now the definition of mutual information is given by this. So <laughs> that is given by the sum of the Shannon information of the system and the uh, Shannon information of the memory minus the Shannon information of the joint system. So this is this can be represented as the intersection of this Venn diagram uh, schematically. And after some short calculation, you can find that this can be represented as this. So this uh, P of SM is a joint probability distribution, and PS and PM are marginal distributions. Yeah, like this. And also, uh, each channel information is given by this. So again, if you are familiar with the Kalbach driver divergence, you will see that this is the Kalbach driver divergence of the joint distribution of and the marginal distributions. So you can see that this is not always non-negative. But anyway, so I think the more in, most intuitive uh, definition of the uh, mutual information is this first line, I think, that is a kind of a shared information between the system and the memory. And also, the mutual information satisfies these two inequalities. So the minimum value is given by zero. In that case, the communication is actually too much noisy, and uh, the daemon cannot get any information about the system. On the other hand, if the communication is perfect, the measurement is error-free, then the mutual information is uh, given by the Shannon information. I'll skip the proof of these inequalities, but yeah, you can show this by using some yeah, not, not very long calculations. And so <laughs> this is, again, the binary symmetric channel case. And uh, this is the uh, mutual information versus the, versus the uh, error rate. So if the error rate epsilon is zero, then the mutual information is given by the maximum value, in this case, log two. On the other hand, if the error rate is one, again, the mutual information is given by the maximum value, that is log two. So because in this case, so the original state zero and one are completely flipped, and zero becomes one, and one becomes zero with a probability one. This means that from the outcome of the measurement, we can always guess the original state uh, one, with 100%. So the mutual information takes the maximum value in this case. On the other hand, if epsilon is given by one half, then the mutual information is given by zero. So this means that in that case, uh, this measurement does not offer any information. So you can imagine that if, you, if somebody always tells a truth, then you can get the perfect information from that person. And also, if that person tells always a lie, then you can also get the perfect information because you can just flip every statement. On the other hand, if that person tells a lie with probability one half and tells the truth, 
with probability one half. So you can't get any information from that person. So th that is the basic idea of the mutual information. And I will show that the mutual information plays, plays the most important role in some dynamics of information. Okay, so next. Let me briefly mention the continuous variable case. So, so far, I assumed that, I implicitly assumed that the variables are di discrete, like uh, 0 and 1 here. But in the continuous variable case, the situation slightly changes. So, first, we can naively define the Shannon information by replacing the summation by the integral. So this naive definition, of course, works. And in many situations, we use this definition. But there's some remark that this uh, continuous variable channel information is not invariant under the uh, state variable transformation. I mean, in continuous variable case, we can change the state variable from x to x prime, for example. And only requirement is that p d p x d x equals p x prime d x prime. So this is only requirement for the uh, state variable transformation. But under this uh, this uh, under this transformation, the channel information is not invariant, and we have some additional Hessian term. So this is Hessian, and we have some additional Hessian term here. So the reason is that we dropped uh, the dx term inside the logarithm to avoid the divergence. So that makes this quantity not invariant. So this, uh, we need to care about this sometimes if you treat this continuous variable channel information. On the other hand, the mutual information is invariant under state variable transformation. And also the callback rival divergence I, that I do not talk in this uh, class, but the callback rival divergence is also uh, invariant under state variable transformation. The reason is that inside the logarithm, we have uh, px divided by p, uh, pxy divided by px and py. So dx dy is canceled uh, in this uh, term. So we have uh, always the same uh, value of the mutual information under the state variable transformation. OK, and the simplest example of the continuous variable communication is uh, given by the Gaussian channel. <laughs> we consider that uh, the noise is given by Gaussian distribution. So we have some original state variable x, and we have some output y. And we suppose that the probability distribution of output y is given by the Gaussian distribution like this. So and this n is the variance of this, this distribution and characterizes uh, the, uh, the intensity of the error or noise. Because if n is very large, then that is that means that the uh, uh, error becomes very dominant. And we can also suppose that the input is also Gaussian for just for simplicity. And in that case, we can analytically compute the output distribution uh, that is given by this. Uh, if the uh, bias of the input signal is given by S, then the output signal the variance of the output signal is uh, just uh, sum of the input and the noise that, that is given by S plus N. So and this is a very simple result, uh, but this is true only for the Gaussian input case. And we can compute the channel information, oh, sorry, channel information of the, uh, sorry, the mutual information of this communication channel. And we will find that the mutual information is given by this uh, simple formula. So this is named Shannon-Hartley formula, if I remember correctly. So 
this is only given by the uh, ratio of the signal intensity and the noise intensity. So if uh, this S over N is zero, then the Mitchell information is zero. So that is very reasonable res result. On the other hand, if S is very large, then the Mitchell information is also logarithmically large. So um, an, an uh, important point of this formula is that the mutual information is given by, only given by the signal to noise ratio, that is S over N. So this gives us a kind of intuition about the mutual information. So in a very old style communication theory, we can adapt the signal to noise ratio as a, as a kind of uh, measure of information transmission. And in this Gaussian case, the mutual information completely, completely reduced to the, that signal to noise ratio. And yeah, we can um, easily understand its intuitive meaning. But another important point is that the mutual information is not restricted to the Gaussian case, of course. So th that is the advantage of the mutual information. So if for, if, for example, you consider some double L potential and binary distribution, then that is far from the Gaussian distribution, but the mutual information still works. So in that sense, the mutual information is, uh, is really meaningful if the distribution is uh, not Gaussian. Okay, so this is a summary of the information theory part. So basically, we have introduced two information contents. So one is the channel information, and that is a measure of a kind of a randomness of the system. And the mutual information characterizes some correlation between the system and the memory. That is the effective information shared by these two objects. And yeah, and the mutual information, mutual information satisfies these inequalities. And if the communication or the measurement is perfect, the mutual information is the same as the channel information. Okay, I think I spent one hour and maybe it's, it's better to <laughs> take questions in the remaining time. Question? Oh, yes. So could you say so it down? in the previous slide, can you yeah. explain again why the variant of y is the sum of variant of x and y? So s plus n for oh. the output. Oh uh, yeah, right here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why is the uh, up? Oh, uh, you, you mean why is it true? The, what, yeah. The yeah. Intuitive meaning is that is just that uh, you have some systems uh, distribution, and you have some additional noise distribution. And the output is just uh, some of them. But you can confirm this by, by some calculation, of course. So maybe I think I have time, so. Yeah. In general, we have this. So this is just a base rule. So, and you can insert these distributions here. So this is uh, this is what we have to calculate. So and this is essentially it's a Gaussian <coughs> integral. So I think you can do that. So and then after some calculations you will get that.
Ah, uh, ah, uh, hello. Uh, you just showed that the Shannon entropy is, invari uh, is not invariant under uh, the change of variable. Yeah. And I am I'm uh, I have a question about that. Is it only uh, uh, so the Shannon entropy? Uh, so my question is, if the variable is not continuous, then the Shannon entropy is invariant. Yeah, yeah. If the variable is discrete, yes. then there's no room for state variable transformation. Ah. So variable is always fixed. So only the continuous variable case, you have some yeah, coordinate transformation, mm -hmm. like x prime equals 2x or something like that. Then, then can, you, uh, can you explain about can you explain with some physical intuition with oh, sorry, physical so intuitively. And the <laughs> reason why yeah. the reason why it's not yeah. invariant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, so yeah, it, I think it's simple reason. So, so yes. Okay, so this is a discrete variable case, right? Yes. And in this case, the um, in this case, so this is a probability. Yes. But in the continuous variable case, the probability is given by p x d x. Yes. So because yeah. In this case, this Px is just a probability density. Yes. But Px dx is the probability. So in that sense, we fundamentally we have to consider this. Fundamentally, we have to consider this. But Obviously, this is a divergent term, so we have to drop this. So from this term, we have that Hessian term, so that makes the that makes the Shannon entropy not invariant. Does this make sense? So I mean, so in the yes. continuous limit, so this becomes. Uh, in the continuous limit, we, this yeah. this term appears here. So yeah. and this is a yeah, divergent term. So in the limit dx goes to zero, this is just divergent. So we have to drop this, and this term makes. Yeah, this term is responsible for that H term. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, following his question, is there any ex example of transformation of the variable? So sorry. Is there any example of that transformation of the variable is needed? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure <laughs> it depends on situations. So, yeah, for example, if you consider a range band system, yeah. so there are many choices of coordinates. Yeah. So, yeah. If you just. If you just. If you consider some yeah, one dimensional. Range by equation like this, so it, yeah, it's physically it's completely okay to choose two x 
instead of x. Yeah, but, but this state transformation, the channel information changes. Of course, energy or heat doesn't change, but yeah, the mutual information changes. I'm not sorry, uh, the channel information changes. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you introduced that uh, for the uniform distribution, the channel entropy is log n, right? Yeah. But if we divide the system into more events, like two times more detail, we yeah. get log 2n, something like that. Yeah. So it feels like uh, entropy is a physical quantity, but mm. if we think different, entropy value changes. So uh, how can we understand something like that? Oh, uh, yeah. So again, if you, the state value is discrete, you can fix the number of the possible events beforehand. I mean, in the case of, for example, in the case of this, in the case of this rotary, uh, n is, of course, two, and if you consider some dice, n is just six or something like that. It's, it's always uh, fixed, I think. Uh, and on the other hand, in the continuous variable case, n is just infinity, so it's just divergent. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, if not, we have, still have some time. <laughs> Maybe we started earlier, I uh, think. No, 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 we didn't oh. start it earlier. Okay. But let me see. I mean, yeah, we started maybe two minutes early. Uh, but okay, that's fine. But uh, uh, so let's take a break. And then uh, Professor Sagawa will continue his uh, uh, second lecture at, let's say, 4 o'clock. Okay? Oh, so we have yes. a 20 minute break. Okay? Okay, thank you. Density. Yeah, exactly. And then you keep the reference density fixed. Um, it's just there you're taking a log of a density, and that's the problem. Yeah. So there's, it's a mathematics, it's called the radon nicotine uh, derivative. So, so the change of the variable uh, changes the reference density. Right. I mean, uh, because yes. it, as you transform any probability density, yes. there's a, you want to keep it normalized, right? So yeah. the measure changes. Density ah, change yeah. differently from functions, right? Yeah, and that's that's really what the problem is with continuous yeah. uh, Shannon entropy definitions: is you need a reference density to make it invariant. Yeah. 
but then you know you always have to justify why this reference density, why not this other one. No, no. But you have to pick a yeah. reference density, and everything gets referred to that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's right. Yeah. yeah no. I, yes. It's, yeah, but it's, anyway, so you could change to this reference density. Then this uh, information, this entropy change, right? Yes. Then, uh, so you have to pick. Point. You have yeah, to yeah, pick so, one. Yeah, yeah. Do all so, your calculations yeah, 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 always yeah. with that. Yeah. Then, 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 then my concern is that then can I call this is like a really kind of meaningful physics quantity? Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. So, so you can, you know, whatever you calculate as energy change, work, information, whatever, is always referenced to the same one, right? Yeah. And so there's a whole, you can do all your calculations and they'll all be consistent. Mm -hmm. And they'll be coordinate invariant, mm -hmm. right? So it's like a coordinate change. When we do coordinate changes in general relativity, right? Yeah. Just because you change the coordinate system, no physics really change, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's exactly like that. It's, in fact, 30 years ago, I wrote a paper <laughs> exactly pointing out if you make density inference Reparameterization invariant by treating it as a density, yeah. then actually you get a unique answer as the perfect density mm -hmm. for your inference, which is what? Which turns out to be the flat uniform density between zero and one, mm -hmm. guaranteed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a, a canonical density for any probability distribution on a finite <laughs> interval. You map it to, you know, basically yeah. a non parameterization yeah. Non-parametric statistics. <laughs> that's a reference density. Yeah, I think that's the reason why k divergence is so important. Yeah, yeah no, so, there's, there's, it's, it's definitely the concept. It's just the reference density is always present here. Hmm. Yes, that's, I had a question. What if you um, use multiplicative noise? Oh, you mean? In, in your s plus n, or oh, 1 yeah. plus N yeah. over S, yeah. right? If you had multiplicative noise, then, oh. because that quite often happens, right? Yeah, yeah. So actually, so this is just a, just a simple yeah. Yeah, fixed look. Yeah, 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 no, I know, I know. But yeah. I was just thinking, as the, you know, like a biological system, yeah. um, the yeah. signal transduction does not yeah. have to be additively noisy. Exactly, yeah. it, it can be multiplicatively noisy, yeah. It, right? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah actually, that might Okay, so general definition of material information is, of course, uh, applicable for yes, multiple of course. No, 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 I mean, everything is applicable. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. the, the last form, right? Yeah. I, I was just thinking out if it's 1 plus S over N mm -hmm. when it's additive, right? Oh, it yeah. would end up as uh, just N mm -hmm. yeah. if it's multiplicative. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, so can, so, can, can no, so, if you okay, go so. flip back one okay, slide. Yeah. So, where you say S plus N, right? Yeah. Yeah. If it's signal times noisy amplification, right? Yeah. So then it's N times S, so to say. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and then, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. actually, by the time you get to this bottom form, it's N S divided by, uh, yeah, N plus S divided by. So it's, the, it, it just becomes multiplicative depending on, right, instead of the S plus N over N, I wonder what does it become? It's just, oh, I have vanishes? What, what does it do? That's, uh, I have never thought about that, but, yeah, it, yeah, I don't know. No, because I mean signal transduction is like an amplification, right? It yeah. doesn't necessarily use only additive noise. Right. There can be noise in how it's amplified. Yeah. Yeah. It's just something to think about. It's yeah. Yeah. I'm just uh, curious. Yeah, yeah, some very simple model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, if you can imagine like a, uh, an analog amplifier, right? Yeah. Then there's, there's some noise, thermal noise, that is changing the volume with some little, right? So that's multiplicative noise. It's changing the amplitude, not necessarily additive. Right? Yeah, yeah. Just some, I'm just curious when I saw this, I was like, wait. Yeah, I don't know what it would do. I mean, I 
Is there is it you you prefer the interpretation of feedback rather than the um, simple uh, interpretation? Uh, you, Sorry, you, you prefer. Uh, I think that you prefer uh, using the feedback interpretation mm. rather than the some simple the hanging the mess uh, some some this kind of uh, interpretation for the Zilla the engine. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so, yeah, I prefer feedback. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so is there a reason? Oh, I, I think it's the most natural standard way to understand the theorem. So uh, actually, I'm not sure hmm. some alternative interpretation. So uh, can you explain in more detail? Uh, uh, the, the, yeah. the hang, hanging the uh, uh, to, uh, to both yeah. sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang, hang the best for, for the right side, left side, uh, depending on the... Oh, uh, that, that is also a feedback. Ah, it is yeah, also that, that is also feel so ah. because we should decide in which side to which side we should attach. So ah. yeah, that, that is also feedback. So both are feedback, but yeah, this is just just to demonstrate. Sorry, this is just to demonstrate uh, the entropy reduction process. Ah. Yeah. So yeah, <coughs> just the attachment of the. Where it is also feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but in, in this case, yeah. hang, hang and mass uh, yeah. do not uh, make decrease of uh, mm. uh, entropy. So uh, essentially, it decreases entropy, but that process is, I think, it's not expressed in that case. Uh, so, yeah, the difference is just if entropy reduction is increased or expressed. So, this is uh, expressed. Um, Maybe this is nice to demonstrate. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so I, I think that in, in that case, uh, there is a memory term, mm. uh, another mm. memory for them only. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So in, in both cases, case, yeah. Uh, so we need to see. Uh, in here also, there is another memory mm. uh, for them. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I will talk uh, so about that. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So, so the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a very nice question. So uh, <laughs> if, if you could ask that uh, during the class, so maybe you could share that. Ah, I see. Yeah. Yeah.